Bible breakfast uh, this coming Saturday, 7.30 to 8.30. We'd love to have you join us. A wonderful breakfast provided, and we'll, we're in the book of Thessalonians. And uh, secondly, our household necessity pantry, the dates of our next giveaway, uh, June 11th. And so on the 9th, we're going to have a packing event. We would love to have you join us as we get ready for our next community giveaway. And let's see, any donations you still have, you can bring them to the church. Great outreach to our community. And finally, Father, Son, uh, Dinner and Kayak. So June 12th. And uh, please sign up for this free event, fathers, sons, grandfathers, grandsons. Uh, we're going to meet at the church for dinner and then drive to the kayak, kayak dock um, to enjoy some time together. So please sign up for that. And with that said, let's prepare to hear God's word. If you will join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that your spirit would open our ears and our hearts we would hear you speak to us on this Pentecost Sunday. May we give reverent attention to your word, that it would bring forth life in our hearts and lives. In your name we pray. Amen. So on this Pentecost Sunday, the first reading, the Old Testament reading, is from Genesis 11. How because of our sin, humanity was scattered and given many different languages, and we couldn't understand each other. The Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. The whole earth had one language and a single vocabulary. As people traveled in the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. They said to one another, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used mud brick instead of stone for building material, and they used tar for mortar. He said, come, let's build a city for ourselves and a tower whose top reaches to the sky. And let's make a name for ourselves so that we will not be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. And the Lord said, if this is the first thing that they are doing as one people, who all have one language, then nothing that they intend to do will be too difficult for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language so they cannot understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. It was named Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This is the word of the Lord. And then from Acts chapter 2. This is a reversal of Babel. That God, in giving the Holy Spirit, the apostles were speaking, and all the disciples, the good news in every language to unite all people into the body of Christ. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the rushing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw divided tongues that were like fire resting on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages since the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak fluently. Now there were godly Jewish men from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And when the sound was heard, a crowd came together and was confused. Because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were completely baffled and said to each other, Look, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them speaking in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and of Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring in our own languages the wonderful works of God. 
They were all amazed and perplexed. They kept saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them and said, ah, they're full of new wine. And then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Men of Judea, all you residents of Jerusalem, understand this and listen closely to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. On the contrary, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is what God says will happen in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and a rising cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And this will happen. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. And finally from the gospel of John, the words of Jesus. As he told them the day of Pentecost would come. This will serve as the basis for our message this morning. John 14, 23 to 31. Jesus answered him, Judas Thaddeus, If anyone loves me, he will hold on to my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who does not love me does not hold on to my words. The word that you are hearing is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I've told you these things while staying with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. You heard me tell you I'm going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you may believe. I will not speak with you much longer because the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. But I want the world to know that I love the Father and that I'm doing exactly what the Father's instructed me. This is the word of Jesus. Please pray with me. Father, I ask that you would speak through me, your servant. And uh, Lord, I thank you for our confirmands here today. Uh, Lord, as they confirm their faith, let your spirit confirm all of us in our faith. To know clearly in Jesus that we belong to you. In your name we pray. Everyone said, amen. What are you holding on to for life? Every single one of us holds on to or clings to something for life. And what you hold on to will steer and direct your life. Just like the picture Hands on the steering wheel. You know, wherever you turn that, that's where the car is going to go. And Jesus made very clear. If you claim to love him, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, he says, if anyone loves me, he will hold on to my word. And you see that last highlighted verse, verse, verse 24. The one who does not love me does not hold on to my words. Now that means if you don't hold on to the words of Jesus, you can't claim to love him or follow him. Now for us as followers of Jesus, we're in a raging spiritual battle that in our society is just ramping up and intensifying as we're getting bombarded from every direction. Uh, All the 
ideologies, philosophies, alternative spiritualities, confusion about identity, not to mention all the bad news that sometimes is like fear porn that is just trying to bring us down. And not only that, you've got fake news, you've got propaganda. I mean, we're just being bombarded. The enemy of our souls wants to distract us from the word of Jesus, to hold on to and cling to anything and everything else except him. You know, and where that temptation comes for us as believers is when he gets us, instead of holding on to his clear, outside of us, objective word as the truth, when he wants us to hold on to and cling to the feelings and emotions of our heart. And this is where we're at as a culture. It's called uh, expressive individualism. Where it's now the, our feelings and, and what our emotions are that we cling to as authoritative and hold on to. And when that happens, then all of a sudden you begin to diminish God's word. And it goes like this. Lee Strobel uh, gave a great illustration Listen to this. He says, imagine a daughter and her boyfriend uh, going out for a Coke on a school night. Must be dating himself. I don't think they're. The father says to her, you must be home before 11. It gets to be 10.45 p.m. And the two of them are still having a great time. They don't want the evening to end, so suddenly they begin to have difficulty interpreting the father's instructions. Well, what did he really mean? When he said, you must be home before 11, did he literally mean us? Or was he talking about you in a general sense, like people in general? Uh, Was he saying, in effect, as a general rule, people must be home before 11? Or was he just making the observation that generally people are in their homes before 11? I mean, he wasn't very clear, was he? And what did he mean, you must be home before 11? Would a loving father be so adamant and so inflexible? He probably means it as a suggestion. I know he loves me, so it isn't implicit that he wants, I mean, he wants me to have a good time. And if I'm having fun, then he wouldn't want me to end the evening so soon. And what did he mean by you must be home before 11? Well, he didn't specify who's home. It could be anybody's home. Maybe he meant it figuratively. Remember the old saying, home is where the heart is. My heart is right here, so doesn't that mean I'm already home? Parents, what would you think if your teenagers reasoned like this? And what did he really mean when he said, you must be home before 11? Did he mean that in an exact, literal sense? Besides, he never specified 11 p.m. or 11 a.m. And he wasn't really clear on whether he was talking about Central Standard Time or Eastern Standard Time. In Hawaii, it's still only quarter to seven. And as a matter of fact, when you think about it, it's always before 11. Whatever time it is, it's always before the next 11. So with all these ambiguities, we can't really be sure what he meant at all. If he can't make himself more clear, we certainly can't be held responsible. Wow. That's where we're at. Our emotions, our feelings have become authoritative. That's what we cling to more and more. And Jesus made very clear, abundantly clear. Oops. How did that happen? I had slides and they disappeared. There we go. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, here we go. I think my slides are getting temperamental and emotional. Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will hold on to my word. And that, those words, hold on to, the underlying Greek term is tereo. Now, some Bible translations have obey. Now, that's included in it, but it's more than that. It's not just sheer outward adherence to a rule or regulation. Tereo means to guard, to keep, to hold on to to treasure. And out of that, you will follow it. You will observe it. You will obey it. And so Jesus is saying, 
if you cling to as your greatest treasure, my word, that's what it means to love me. That's what it means to follow me. That my word is the greatest treasure in your life. My word, Jesus says, that reveals who he is. For it was in this chapter that he said, I am the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So that in his word, we get unmistakable, clear truth of who our creator God is and how he loves us in Jesus, how he's redeemed us by his redeeming death and by his resurrection gives us new life. And he's very clear about who we are and how we are to live as his children. So he says, if you love me, you will cling to, you will treasure. This will be your most important treasure that you hold on to. Not anything else that, that would vie for our attention. And Jesus says, when you hold on to this, you'll know how much the Father loves you. Judas, Thaddeus, not Iscariot, was asking, well, why is it that this revelation that we have it and the world doesn't? And it hinges on the words of Jesus. Those who do hold on to and cling to the truth of his word that is objective and outside of us and is authoritative even over our lives and our feelings, our experiences. He says, you hold on to that, grasping it in faith. He says, my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. And Jesus says, these words are not mine, they come from the father. As he reveals the heart of the Father to us. And as we in faith hold on to his word, he says, we'll come and make our home in you. We'll live and dwell in you. And you will know the love of the Father. He will fill us. His love will fill our hearts. That void in us. Not anything else in the world that we would hold on to and cling to to find happiness and joy. For it is only in clinging to his word that we receive that certain truth. Of how much our creator God has loved us in Jesus. But here's the thing. We can't do that on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. I can slide. There we go. All right. We can't do that on our own. You know, the disciples. Jesus is telling them before he gets arrested and goes to the cross... And when he's arrested, I mean, they're all going to flee, and Peter's going to deny him. And it's not until the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost that then they give, get this courageous faith to hold on to the words of Jesus, that they understand it. And a courageous faith, even in the face of persecution, say, yes, we believe in Jesus. And they hang on to it. And so Jesus is clear. It's only the Holy Spirit that can give us the strength, the faith, to hold on to his word. So he told them, I've told you these things while staying with you. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. So when Jesus, who rose, who ascended, poured out the Spirit on Pentecost through the words that Jesus spoke... He brought faith to life in their hearts, and they held on to that word. They knew the love of the Father, and they had a bold courage to go forth and speak that word. It's the same with us. It's through the words of Jesus the Holy Spirit comes to empower a faith that holds on to and clings to his word, which is why we need to hear it, which is why we need to be God's people hearing the word of God, which is why we need to be in it, be in the Holy Scriptures and meditating on his promises for the Holy Spirit comes through the words of Jesus, brings them to life, reminds us of them and who we are as loved by the Father. He will teach us all things and remind us of everything he told us. But you know what? Our grasp is going to get weak. There's times we're going to weaken, and our hold on Jesus and his words is going to get weak. And I think an illustration, especially seeing the rain this morning, is of a father with his little girl. It's holding an umbrella, walking down the street, and the girl trips in a puddle of water, and she, lo she loses her grasp. She slips. 
and she can't hold on to her dad anymore. That happens to us. We lose our, our, our grasp, our grip, our hold on Jesus and his words, and we slip, and we're, we fall, and yet the father grasps a hold who never let go, even tighter, and keeps her from falling. And in the grasp of her daddy, the daughter then is able to reclasp the hand of her father. And the same is true for us. Our Greek grip will weaken at times and we'll feel like we're falling. And yet the spirit reveals that in Jesus the father never lets go of you. He holds on to you even when your hold gets weak. Paul in Philippians 3.24 says, not that I have already obtained this or that I've reached the goal, but I press on to hold on to that for which he has taken hold of me. He holds on to you even when your grasp is weak. He has called you by name. He has loved you with an everlasting love. has redeemed you in Christ Jesus. He's put his name on you in the waters of baptism and declared your identity. He's saying, you're my beloved child. I've washed away all of your sins. You are mine. So that in the revelation of that grasp on your life, we are strengthened to reclasp his hand. Because in him, in his word, we have true joy. We have hope, and we have peace. I want to leave you with this. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And you know, whatever comes, whether gas goes to $10, $15 a gallon, and, and economy, and I hope not, economy implodes or we go to World War III or students, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm failing this class or, you know, the world just seems like it's imploding no matter what happens. Jesus speaks peace. The world can't give it. But he does. He says, I am your peace. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not let it be afraid. Hold on to the word of Jesus no matter what comes because he's holding on to you and he will never let go. That's the kind of God you have. Amen?